I think, you know, guys that understand his system uh, catch on to it quickly. I mean, he, he talked about throwing a lot at him early, seeing what they can handle. I mean, the guys that can handle it, uh, they'll, they'll love his system. I mean, Welcome back in, everybody. A Coordinator Friday edition of Birds 365. We are joined now by Paul Domowich, Hall of Fame selector. Paul, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, guys. Good to be here. Domo, uh, yeah, it's good to have you on Big Fangio, the Big Fangio postgame show, um, because you met back, what is it, 84, I guess? Uh, it's 40 years. Um, he started with Philadelphia Stars. What a great team, by the way. Um, and uh, now he's back with the Philadelphia Eagles. Boy, he's impressive. And in, and in, in, did you get that sense? It's forty. Obviously, he's had so much experience. But did he have something back then? Because he's going to run the exact same shit uh, as Sean Desai ran, and nobody's going to question it uh, just because of his presence. I, I think it's a big deal. I really do, because he he buy people buy into what he's doing. And it makes a big difference. Yeah. I mean, back then he was low man on the totem pole. Yeah. Uh, he'd come from North Carolina. As a but did he have an inkling? Did you see the, the just, you know, sometimes you see guys have personalities and you just see the the, yeah. the the beginning of it. Well, he came from Northeastern Pennsylvania, so I knew he was immediately was going to be a success. <laughs> uh, yeah. he. I mean, he's always, you know, you, you've always seen – Everywhere he's been, uh, you know, going from the Stars to the Saints to the Panthers and et cetera. I mean, he's always – you've seen the fact that he knows what he's doing, knows how he wants to get there, uh, you know, what he wants from players. Um, you know, he's not he's, – he's not – you know, he's not going to – you know, you don't look at him and see, a, you know, wow, this guy's you know, schemes like nobody I've ever seen. He just takes a defense and gets the most out of it and uh, – Usually is very successful with that formula. Yeah, it was good to hear him say he still needs great players. His scheme yeah. is not the end-all, be-all. He knows he needs great players. So good to hear. Dom, I want to ask you about the element of Vic where he's going to work these guys. He's going to work them more than they've been worked in previous years. How do you think that bodes in the locker room? I think, you know, guys that understand his system uh, catch on to it quickly. I mean, he, he talked about throwing a lot at him early seeing what they can handle. I mean, the guys that can handle it, uh, they'll, they'll love his system. I mean, he, he can only work them so hard. I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. the rules of the league uh, prevent, yeah. I think he, 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 that was mentioned at the press conference. He, he, he could, he can't tell Nick, let's go with the, you know, two a days. Yeah. Pads, that just isn't going to happen anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think the, the Drew Rosenhaus comments from Miami last year, yeah. About, Players not like him. You know, I mean, I've known Drew almost as long as I've known Vic. And, you know, Drew just babies his players and pampers them. And and so you, you expect that when they don't perform well. And a lot of those Dolphins did not play well last year. Well, and, and the Dolphins defense was pretty good, actually. I mean, they, they suffered a bunch of injuries to some of their best pass rushers late, yeah. so that affected them. But they, they were actually a, a pretty solid defense, and that's where I think um, he generally, and I think your description was a, was a good one, he's generally going to get the most out of what he has. And I start to think about last year if the timing worked out, and Vic confirmed a lot of stuff. I'm glad he confirmed it. You know, he would have been here, but the timing didn't work out. He was consulting, but he was mainly helping the offense, stuff like that, um, when he did consult. Um, so he confirmed all that. But I, I started to think, Damo, if he was here last year, what would have happened? And I think it would have been a little bit better. But I think you got a ceiling because there just wasn't enough talent, especially on the back end. So maybe he turns them from the 26th ranked defense into the 20th or 18th. But I think that would have been the ceiling. Yeah. I think the issue is they need better players. And that's sort of what he said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I was always curious last year, you know, cause I mean, it was clear he wanted to be here uh, and would have been <clears throat> if things, if the timing had been different with the Eagles, 
I was always curious if after he got to Miami three days later, when, when you know, when the Eagles made their changes, if he had said, you know, to Stephen Ross, uh, you know, do you mind if I go back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, well, it was well known down there. I talked to a bunch of people who covered the Dolphins. It was well known down there by, you know, in season that he wanted to be in Philadelphia. Yeah. But I asked him like right away, because I think that to me was the whole story. Was there a concern that Bick would back out of the contract? Because he agreed to terms, but then the Eagles signed an actual contract, if you remember, to be a consultant leading up to the Super Bowl. So the Dolphins actually gave him permission to do that mm -hmm. and, and be that consultant. And from their end, there was no concern that he would back out because he's too much of a pro, I guess. Yeah. But from my, my standpoint would have been, all right, yeah, he's too much of a pro. He's not going to back out. And by the way, they gave him the largest coordinator contract in NFL history. That helped as well. But if I were the Dolphins at that point, I would have said, you know what? The guy doesn't want to be here. We might as well go in a different direction. That's what I would have thought the Dolphins would have done. But it, it, Mick wasn't going to back out on that deal. He's too much of a pro. He agreed to it. He's not going to back. He's not going to Josh McDaniels them, is what I would say. And that's sort of how it um, how it came out. You know, we always talk to you about Hall of Fame stuff. Now, um, what what's it called? I, th I think it's called the Awards for Excellence or some not. But they're starting to um, they're starting to acknowledge assisting coaches. I, I think Monty Kiffin was one of them. A couple other guys, I forget. But this guy's like, he's in that realm as an assistant, don't you think? And not, you know, not as a head coach, but as an assistant. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the two best defensive coordinators or defensive people I've been around uh, my entire career were him and Jimmy Jim Johnson. Uh, you know, different characters, but both you know, old school uh great coaches that uh you know got got the most out of their players and you know that's what we'll, i think we'll you know people are going to see here yeah. yeah i'm excited to see it Vic. i said to john at the top of the show the first thing i took away from the pressers was experience 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 those yeah. guys have been doing it a while and you could tell just by listening to them dom i want to get your first first takeaways on what you heard from kellen moore obviously some talk about the meshing of the offenses and the, you know, that might be a little bit complicated. John and I were just kicking it around and to open the show. What, what was your first takeaways from Kellen? Likes a clean toolbox. Yeah. Clean operation, baby. Yeah. I think, I think all, all football coaches uh, secretly wanted to be carpenters. They always talk about the toolbox. Um, you know, I mean, he's good. It, it's going to be, you know, I, I, I like the hire. Um, you know, he talked about, I think somebody asked him about the, the motion. That you was know, me. Yeah, no, that was Johnny Mack. Yeah. yeah, I heard that. Clearly, Nick had no use for it. Didn't even make it a secret, which, you know, and then he goes and hires a guy who's uh, bullish on it. Uh, and, and, you know, so, I mean, it's going to be good to see an offense that actually uses it. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I mean, the big the big thing that we're going to wait to find out is the, the impact he and his and Neusmeyer have on uh, the, the quarterback because everything revolves around the quarterback this year. You know, all the pieces are in place. I mean, this is this is a, I mean, this offense has more talent than uh, you know probably any team in the league. But it, it needs that quarterback to play like he did two years ago um, to make it all work. So you know that I'm going to be interested to see the relationship develop between uh, Kellen Moore and 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 uh, Jalen. Yeah, I I think that's the biggest story of the year. Um... And and not so much Jalen, but the relationship between uh, Nick and Kellen Moore. Because, and, and Xander and I were talking about before you hopped on, Tomo. I'm like, look, if you believe in a guy, like you believe in Vic, you let him do his job. If you believe Kellen Moore's the guy and you yeah. wanted to change, you got to let him do. And, and he was speaking like he's got to have feet on both sides of the fence and the fact that, well, 
you 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 could do your stuff you want to do with the motion and that kind of stuff, but we're good at this, so you got to put that in there. And and my whole take on that, Damo, is well, if he's really a good offensive coordinator, that's gonna come naturally. He's gonna yeah. understand what Jalen Hurts does well, and the RPO stuff's gonna be a part of it. I don't like the declaring if that's what's going on, that oh, you gotta keep this. You gotta I I, I don't think that's gonna work. Your thoughts on that. I mean, I don't, I don't think Nick's going to push a lot on him because, I mean, I, you know, Nick reports to people that love this hire. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I think Kel, Kellen Moore's thirty-five. He knows what he doesn't know as well as what he does know. Uh, so he's going to be, you know, he's going to be uh, receptive to what Nick has to say. But he also knows that he's pretty much got that offense right now. It's his to run, uh, and I think Nick is smart enough to know. That unless, and I I don't force see it, but I mean unless this thing just completely caves in, uh, you just keep your distance. You let it, you know you encourage him. You, you you know you sit there and you applaud the you know whatever he has to say, and you know you make a suggestion here and there, but you don't push uh, much on him. I mean he he's smart enough to know things uh, that that they did well last year that he might want to implement. Uh, so I don't, you know, that, that's what, I mean, Nick, Nick cannot, I mean, Nick needs to be the CEO coach, uh, this year. Yeah, I agree. But I, I do question, well, I'll disagree with Johnny Mack in that a perfect example is the motion. We've talked about the offense last year as, as, as mad as fans were at the offense, the offense was not awful by any metric. They were, I think the eighth ranked offense or yeah. Number whatever. eight. Yeah. Number eight. If you take that offense and you add a guy like Kellen who can add motion, who can do do some of the things the Eagles didn't do well, don't you think that would make for a more all-encompassing offense that works for the players in the room? Well, I disagree with you <clears throat> in, in one respect, Xander. The last six, seven games when that that you know when they when they went into their nosedive, the offense did not play well. Uh, oh, yeah, that's we couldn't protect. I mean, you know, Jalen went into a funk, uh, didn't seem to know how to handle uh, uh, or blitzes, uh, became a sitting duck. They become uh, he became obsessed with the deep ball. So they need to, you know, I mean, so so there, I mean, it, it wasn't like everything was fine, and you know, now they got a new offensive coordinator, uh, so they, they do need to make adjustments, uh, you know, so that. I, yeah, that's where you're saying a new voice might benefit them more. Yeah. 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 When it comes to jail, and I don't think there was any doubt that this team got um fell in love with the big play too much and was always trying to push even when defenses made adjustments and tr trying to take that away and did take it away. They were trying to force the football down the field too much, especially in blitz situations where you know, people would get frustrated. They have no hot routes, Domo. They have no hot routes. Um, and they're always trying to run verticals down the field. Seattle, perfect example of that, where if you just take what they're giving you, you win that game. You just meticulously march down the field. Uh, you win the game. And they're trying to push it. And they're going off script. And he's throwing into double coverage. He's underthrowing. A.J. Brown, they lose the game. So I I don't think there's any question about um, they fell in love with that and and the lack of motion was just weird I I think it goes back to Philip Rivers because Nick loves Philip Rivers and Philip didn't like motion and Philip was smart enough to you know decipher things through formational tricks um, and that's what he was comfortable with and I think Nick got comfortable with that. And it's like, well, now you have a different quarterback. You don't have a guy who's been playing since the dawn of time uh, who understands everything. So I think that's the problem there. But when people get caught up in play calling and lack of motion, and I go back and I was just telling Xander, what it, 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 Kellen was asked, what, what's the most important thing for you as a play caller on game day? He said, clean operation. Not talking about a play. He's not talking about motion. He's talking about execution. He's talking about understanding what's going on, not throwing into double coverage. 
clean operation. To me, that's about teaching during the week. It's not sexy. You know, people want to see the motion and the right. and the and the and and all the great stuff, but it's about doing it right, not about doing it right with aesthetics, I guess is my take. Your belief on that. Yeah, I mean, I I think both Vic and Kellen said the same thing about, you know, the importance of, you know, I think Vic, the way Vic phrased it was, you know, we, we if we start to struggle in a game, don't expect me to scheme us out of it. We're yeah, gonna, exactly. We're gonna go back to basics. Yeah. Do do what we do well, and 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 do it that way. And I think Kellen Moore has the same philosophy on offense. Uh, you know, I mean, he's not going to try to get fancy if, if when they're struggling. Uh, I mean, they're going to do the things that they, you know, that he finds out they can do well uh, early on here, and and use that uh, as their basis uh, going forward. I want to yeah. ask both of you guys this question: Do you think Nick and John? Maybe this is partly why they're they want to have so much cohesion on offense or the meshing of two systems. Do you think with these these are these coordinators are a lot different than the previous coordinators they've had. Do you think Nick is starting to feel like he could lose control in a way where you have now I got Vic Fangio. He's clearly the boss on defense. If I give the offensive reins completely to Kellen and they have great success, do you think he might be feeling a little bit of really being neutered and and not having success and really not having a leg to stand on if something either goes well or goes wrong? I don't think he should. Uh, I mean, I don't know what's going on in Nick's head, but, I mean, there are a lot of CEO coaches in this league. I mean, it's the best way to run a team, in my opinion. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, yeah. is, is you know, you have coordinators, uh, you let them do their thing, and, and you're looking at the big picture. You know, you're on game day, you know, you're overseeing the whole thing so that you know how to, you know, what's going on out in the field if you have to make a, a snap decision regarding a challenge or, uh, or what to do on third down, uh, you know, but you let your, your uh, coordinators basically run things and, and you oversee it. Yeah. I always go to Kyle Shanahan, Damo. I'm the biggest Kyle Shanahan fan in the world as a play caller, play schemer. I think he's the best. He's got the best feel. Um, he utilizes players better than anybody else. Um, and I think he's a, bad head coach at times because he's a terrible game manager and yeah. he's a terrible game manager because he's bogged down with all that stuff. Why can't he import that to his top Lieutenant and say, this is what I want done yeah, and, and manage the damn game. And then you probably get over the hump and win a super bowl um, at some point. Cause he's so good at, at that kind of stuff. I, I I'm with you. I used to tell Jody all the time. CEO coach. I, if I were an owner, if I were Jeffrey Lurie, I would want to see I every owner. I would want a CEO coach. I would make that a job description. I said, I, I don't want you calling plays. Now you have the other side of the fence that are always worried about. Well, if you have a great play caller and you lose a play caller, I think it's BLG our buddy, Brandon Lee Gout, and I think has the best uh, phrase. If you're a good team, you're going to lose coaches. Just yeah. accept it. That, 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 that's part of it. I, I, people get all what, what? What if Shane Steichen was still here? It's not going to be. You went to the Super Bowl. That's the way it works. You lose. They lost uh, Frank Reich and, and John DiPolippo after they won the Super Bowl. That's that's what you should be striving for to lose assistant coaches because that means. You're really good and really successful. Yeah, I've never bought the. Fl I mean, when you had so many teams obsessed with hiring an offensive head coach, that was their, that was their thinking. Well, if we, if we only hire a guy that we think is a genius as our offensive coordinator, somebody's going to steal him the next year. Yeah. Well, so what? There's 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 <laughs> no. there's, a, there's a dozen other offensive yeah. geniuses out there. So, um, you know, I, I yeah, I mean, I you, you hire the best coach. I mean. Dick Vermeil, when he finally won a Super Bowl in St. Louis, uh, was a CEO coach. Uh, yeah. You know, you look down the, you know, you can, there's just 
dozens and dozens of successful coaches. Tom Coughlin. Tom was a guy yeah, who, exactly. and I, I actually talked to Tom once because I, I gave him that theory. This is many years ago. I, because I said, why aren't there more CEO coaches? And he, at which I, I didn't think about it at the time. He said, well, when you first get the job, you, you have to, you know, sort of set the stage in the building. So yeah. you want to be on charge on one side of football. So I did take that under account. And then as you get a foothold in the door of the organization, you grow more comfortable, you can morph into the CEO coach. That was his thought process. I'm paraphrasing, which yeah. I found interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm, man, if I, I, if I think I have a good head coach, he's got to be a part of everything. Yeah. Like I Sean McVay, I went, Dama, sorry. When he first got that job, you can go back and watch games, the Rams games. He would leave when the defense was on the field. He would go sit with the quarterback and not even pay attention. Yeah. And Wade Phillips would be running the defense. It was probably good, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't like that. I, that's not what I want out of a head coach. I think you're the head coach of the football team, or you should be. Yeah. It's tough when you're when you're when you're interviewing for the job if you say, Yeah, I'm probably not going to deal with either side. I'm going to kind of oversee, I'm going to hire a good guy. I mean, hiring, hiring, hiring good assistants is probably the most important part of being a head coach. If you have a good staff, you'll <laughs> succeed. Uh even if you're even if you're a screw up, you'll probably succeed as long as you <laughs> stay out of their way. Yeah. Uh but it's, you know, I, I mean, it's the same thing in any workplace. I mean, you hire good people and let them do their job. Uh, you're probably right. going to be very successful. If you don't, you're not. Yeah, I think where I'm going is the the recent history, right? I mean, Andy Reid won the last two Super Bowls. He's calling plays. Who did he verse this year? He versed Sean, um, Kyle Shanahan, who's calling plays. John talks about Sean McVay. He won a Super Bowl three years ago. So I think maybe that's, you know, I think both of them can work. But I don't. I don't disagree that being a CEO head coach is probably the better perspective. But in an offensive NFL where they're changing rules, where the defense can't do as much, I do think there's there's still a a big focus on having that offensive minded head coach. And that's where I wonder if Nick is doesn't want to completely lose control of the offensive side of the football. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he already has though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and I mean, Andy Reid is probably the exception, not the rule. But he is the one winning Super Bowls right now, and he's you know he's still a man in that offense. I think the reason, the, the one reason a, a head coach doesn't want to let go of something, is because he might feel insecure about his job, secure you know situation. Right. Which maybe Nick does feel after last year. Well, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in his mind right now. I don't know what they told you. Know, I don't know how the. I don't know how the off season just. Uh, a relationship changed between him and Howie and, and Jeffrey, if it did at all, uh, whether he's going into this season, believing he's on the, you know, uh, I, I'm sure he's going to be on a lot of on the hot seat uh, uh, lists uh, in the preseason. Yeah. Should, should he? I don't know. I, I, I don't think yeah. so. I don't, you know, I don't think it changed with Howie uh, yeah. because if you go back to the, they look like, you know, they look like they got taken to the woodshed by dad yeah. uh, and both of them after the collapse. And, you know, they look tired and beaten down. Like they just got yelled at for 24 hours straight. And, yeah. you know, as we go by through the draft, now they're back buddy, buddy doing their two man comedy show up at the uh, <laughs> podium. I, I think they're fine. I think maybe it shifted a little bit with Jeffrey. They found mm -hmm. out that, you know, all right, we can't make dad unhappy. Um, <laughs> I, but who knows? We'll see how that shakes out. But I, I, th I think him and Howie are still on the same page. I really do. Yeah. Um, yeah. They seem to get along well, which is helpful. Yeah. Tom, I want to bring you back to obviously the, the, the other thing that was being widely talked about yesterday was Chip Kelly. And the 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 what Lashawn and Sh and uh, Deshaun and Shady talked about on their podcast. Just bring us back to when you covered the covered the team with Chip Kelly. What 
What are some of what you remember from covering Chip Kelly? I know that was right before John started covering the Eagles, but anything that you remember that just sticks out at you like a sore thumb, especially after hearing the comments that that Deshaun and Shady had yesterday? Well, I mean, the thing, the, the few things that, that that I remember about Chip, uh, I mean, one, he was scared to death of the media there uh, here. Uh, he get when it would go out to their to those press conferences in the tent on the field and see so many. I mean, you know, he, he, he had never seen crowds like that. Before. It is daunting. And yeah. It's scared yeah, the hell out of it. I mean, it, it's why, you know, the, the PR staff suddenly started turning down. I remember shortly after that, Harrisburg wanted a credential uh, to cover the Eagles. And they wouldn't give them one because because at the, the PR guy at the time was afraid of, of, of the, you know, how Chip would react to uh, the crowd getting even bigger. Um but I mean, I liked, I kind of got along with Chip. Uh, if you asked him an intelligent question, he gave you a very intelligent answer. Uh, yeah. But he just was, you know, I mean, his his downfall was that he did not know, you know, how to deal with people, uh, his relationship inside the building with players. I mean, he's not a guy that gets warm and fuzzy with people or or even he's not a guy that even likes to, to, to you know, do small talk and, that ultimately was why Jeffrey, yeah. you know, Jeff, I forget what the term Jeffrey used at the time. Emotional intelligence. That's right. Yeah. Uh, he did yeah. not have that. Uh, yeah. You know, well, so. I, I got to kick out because I was, I wasn't there every day, but I was back and covering the league more nationally. So I'd be down there once in a while um, at the end of chip. And they still let us in the building at that time, Damo. Yeah. So, um, mm-hmm. And I remember what I first remember is he would make no eye contact at any point. Uh, now, you know, you would think, and then Doug showed up the next year, emotional intelligence. And I remember I was walking down the hall. I think it was with Ed Bank and Ed Bank and uh, KYW ESPN now. Uh, and Doug said, hi. And I'm like, looking around, <laughs> I'm like, oh, the head coach can talk to us uh, because Chip would just keep his eyes down. Um, and yeah, that to me spoke of emotional intelligence. Um, it's just the little thing, but yeah, he was, he was a weird dude, but I give him credit. He brought a lot of things to the NFL that they still use today. I I think he had no filter. I think he had no understanding of how to deal with men versus college kids. Like Jason Peters hated him because at the time, Jason was what thirty, mid thirties. You running. can't run him around like it. I, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, there's it's, no common sense. It's funny after after he got fired, uh, the one guy who never said anything bad about him uh, while he was there went off on him, and that was Lane. Lane, yeah, Lane. Lane yeah. kept it all inside of him for three years or two, two plus years. About they call it bullshit. Playing in this offense yeah. where you know you're just grind, you know, eighty plays a game. You're just, you know, the offense is not huddling. They're just you know hurrying back to the line. Yeah. And finally, after he left, I mean, Lane just ex- unloaded on him. Yeah, and Lane was young at the time, in good good shape for an offense. He was still in good shape, but you know, if anybody could have handled it, it was Lane. But that was just. Remember the rosters you have in college at that time. It's like yeah. you, you just roll them in. Yeah. It's like you got 53 guys, dude. You got to get a filter. Yeah, that to me. Uh, Something's on the sideline, uh, co- you know, the college uh, yeah. routine. Uh, yeah. You know, I remember, you know, when he first got there, you know, he's, his, his offense was not complicated. I mean, no. it was only, it was it was only the simplest thing players. in the world. It was and like the skepticism back then. You know, as per, as when his players first saw the offense, they're like, they're going to catch on to this. It's kind of like a team that uses in basketball that that just uses the pick and roll. I mean, yeah. it's just like, you know, they're going to figure this out. Well, no, if you do it right, if you execute it right, it'll work just fine. Yeah, and His offense did, I mean, uh, for the most part. Oh, my God. The first game was, yeah. was against Washington. They thought the league, he just remade professional football. Um <laughs> I yeah, his card. Remember his card, his play card used to say S3. I don't know what S3 stood for, but uh they called S3 a lot. 
Um, and everybody else has got these cheesecake factory menus, uh, play yeah. call sheet, uh, chips out there with this little tiny thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was the simplest thing ever, but what he did bring the sports science stuff, the, the, that kind of, um, you know, the, the lighter practices that, that, that is all taken hold in the NFL. Um, and he really was at the forefront of that, but he just could not deal with people. Especially yeah. people with, you know, they're adults and professionals, and they make a lot of money, and you can't, you can't handle them the way, same way you handle some eighteen-year-old kid, um, you know, going to college for the first time. Are you yeah. just like you higher that IQ and lower EQ. I think that's what you call it for emotional yeah. intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think. He was a better coach than people give him credit for. They did make the playoffs, what, twice, Dama? Yeah, ten, two 10-10 ten ten win seasons. Uh, yeah. You know, he probably doesn't go if he knew how to get along with people better. I wonder yeah, if he would have been a better coordinator. I mean, John, you talk about how some of his offensive philosophies are still used today in the league. I mean, yeah, he we're couldn't manage say, the people part. Be, he couldn't yeah. be the head coach part. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was a smart guy, maybe a more introverted guy. I, I got the weirdest question yesterday. Is 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 Big Fangio going to be more like Bill Davis? I got uh, <laughs> a chips defensive coordinator. I'm like, I I don't get, uh, no, and now he's not. I said, uh, you've been you've been watching the Big Fangio scheme for three years already. For people that don't know, you're just getting the guy who created it and probably can teach it better. Um, but yeah, Chip didn't even care about defense, did he? He he wanted he he wanted to he he thought Travis Long was better than Brandon Graham. Yeah, uh, yeah. That would that was that was the other part of the podcast that they came out that he also wanted to get rid of Brandon Graham and Jeff Lurie stepped in. That was that would have been that would have sucked if Travis Long didn't tear his ACL two consecutive years. Brandon Graham would have been out of here. Yeah. Out. I believe it. Yeah, I mean that's why Shady hates him. I mean that's the if Shady, you know, if Shady didn't get traded, he probably still think Chip's a pretty good guy. But. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. He went. I mean, to he, was, he was. I think he was an All Pro two years in a row with 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 Chip. Shady, yeah. Shady said he was trying to. I, I. What did he say? He was trying to kill me I, because he went to Buffalo. <laughs> no, I mean, look, that, I I I don't want to live in Buffalo either. But I, I Jordan Matthews had the best quote when he went to Buffalo. Uh, he had a baby and he said, called it a Buffalo baby. He said, what the hell else am I going to do? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, Buffalo is pretty good team. I, I don't want to be there, but I don't think he was trying to <laughs> destroy Le Shady's life, but uh, boy, those guys really hate him. I, yeah. I, uh, yeah. Well, Dama, let me ask you because there, you know, I, I, I agree. I, I, I liked hearing a lot of what you thought about him when you were here, but, did you see any racial undertones? Obviously, they brought that up on the podcast that he was uncomfortable around black players. The NFL is obviously a a, dom a black athlete dominated league. Did you did you notice any of that from your when you were covering him? He was uncomfortable around everybody. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, yeah. Well, no, I did not see any racial. Uh, yeah. I didn't see any prejudice or uh, problems with that. I mean, I you know, I, like I said, I don't think he could. He had problems dealing with everybody. So yeah, he was an introverted guy. It sounds like. Yeah. yeah I guess. Yeah. That's one word. I mean, anybody that would, you go down the hall and like you pass somebody and even if it's your owner and you don't even make eye contact and say, hello. Right. that's what I said. You don't make <laughs> eye contact. That's when you know you got a problem. Right. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. He, emotional. Jeffrey coined that. Some of, some of these times when Jeffrey does these, uh, dissertations he does he comes up with some interesting terms that that was one that hit hit the nail on the head he should get credit for that one because he had no emotion oh, that's, that's the benefit of a brandeis education right there yeah right there well done jeffrey that was a good one <laughs> gold standard quarterback factory um i how he was quarterback factory i yeah. can't blame yeah. jeffrey for that one gold standard that didn't work out yeah pretty good standard but not gold yeah. Paul Domwich, everybody, make sure you follow Paul on Twitter at P Domo. I've been covering the Eagles for a long time. A Hall of Fame selector has always done great work. Domo, I want to ask one more question before we let you go. Sure. If the bar's here, this is I feel better. 
this is I feel worse. What do you think after the after the coordinator spoke yesterday? I'm not going to let you choose. I feel the same. It has to be at least a little bit this way or a little bit this way. I feel better. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm being selfish by looking at it from the media standpoint. I think these guys are going to be, especially Vic, is going to be a little bit more candid and honest uh, rather than go into those weekly press conferences that uh, John's going to be attending with the attitude that I, I have to say as little as possible or give them as little information as possible. But I, you know, I think this offense and defense are both going to, you know, I, along with what Howie has given them. Right. I think this is going to be a much better team this year. Yeah, uh, I'm with Damo. I'm a I'm a big Vic Fangio guy. He's going to get the most out of. I I, I don't think they're good enough defensively, talent wise, but I think he's going to get the most out of what he has, yeah. and that's the definition of good coaching to me, anyway. Uh, yeah, I liked what I heard from the coordinators yesterday. Uh, Damo, thanks for joining us, man. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care. Have yeah. a good weekend. Thanks, Damo. Uh, John, real quick before we get to a break. Did Vic address that at all, the the talent level on the defense? I know he's obviously talked about it. he needs great players. You just said it. Yeah, you know, well, I think, players, you know, but- if you're going to nitpick, um, and I thought it was a pretty impressive performance, but if you're going to nitpick one thing, he was asked about the linebackers, and he fumbled coming up with the names. Like he had to get he the roster Zach out. On, I mean. Yeah, he, he had to get the roster out, and we were throwing out names to him. I'm like, oh boy, this like because we've been talking about that a lot this week. This is not a good linebacker situation. No, it's not. I don't care. I mean, look, I I get it. Football people have to be optimistic by nature, um, but when it comes to, I know my buddy Ed Kratz is like high on the linebacker. But I'm like, how can you be high on this freaking linebacker situation? You can hope. You can hope as Howie will say, hope is not a strategy, but you you can cross your fingers and do all that stuff and get out the rabbit's foot and say maybe things. But if you're being objective, this is not a good linebacker situation compared no, to the rest not. of the league. I mean, let's be honest here. The Eagles are talented at a lot of positions. Linebacker ain't one of them. Is there any chance how he's telling Vic, hey, don't even worry about the names on the roster right now. I got some plans cooking up. I got some trade ideas. I, I, I well, I think there's always uh, a chance. I believe Howie, right? I, I, I think Howie is well aware he's not good enough at linebacker. Um, and we saw what happened last year. It was the same situation with Zach Cunningham and Miles Jack coming in in August. And Shaq Leonard coming in to save the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think how he's well aware, uh, but I don't think that's the reason Vic was fumbling for the names. I think it was like, uh, uh, that's, you know, and, uh, and boy, I mean, the more I get a feeling, not like Devin white is the tent pole of that group. Like it, it, the Eagles, believe Jeremiah Trotter Jr. And again, we've talked about fifth round picks. They believe he's a, a, a Mike linebacker, a, a old school, uh, not old school, but uh, a Mike linebacker. He's not, he doesn't have that versatility. They don't want to play him at will is what I'm trying to say. Um, and if that's the case, he's pushing to Kobe Dean. He's not pushing Devin white. Um, which means, you know, they're probably not, and they shouldn't uh, put all their. Uh, Nicobe's not. I think a lot of people, myself included, before I started getting back down there, thought, "Well, he's the guy who's he's going to be there if he's healthy." I, I'm not sure of that anymore. I, I think they're hoping he gets pushed. Um, and Devin White's the one guy where he seems penciled in as a starter, which is frightening. If that's your that's your guy, and that's that's the only guy who's penciled in, that's a bad situation. That's a. I mean, that's why Vic doesn't know any of the names. <laughs> and Zach Ball, yeah. I mean, how he's talking about Zach Ball and like he was going to be the Andrew Van Ginkle 
of which is more of an edge player and the flat defender and and the, <laughs> which yeah Nick likes to drop edge defenders in coverage um which fans will love um I think that's he, overblown for what it's worth. I mean, no, it's always completely gonna be, overblown. I there's always going to be nuance in every defense. There's always going to be sometimes a play that's Hassan Reddick yeah. dropped seven times into coverage under Matt Patricia. He may be poor. There was one outlier of a game where he dropped seven times. Otherwise, it was three times, two yeah. times, 50, couple, 60 plays. I mean, yeah. Know. It's so overblown. I'm with you 100%. I just, you know, people lose their minds. When yeah, you read Twitter it. and you would think Hassan Reddick's yeah. Hassan Reddick covering the wide receivers. Yeah, they just lose their minds when he, uh, it's not a big deal. I just meant fans are not going to be happy with it. But yeah, he mentioned Zach Bond first. I, I don't know if that was his stumbling around, but he thinks he, he may, he, he was very clear that he thinks he can play inside linebacker, off ball linebacker, stack linebacker, whatever you want to call it. Isn't that, isn't that where Nicobe is – or not Nicobe. Isn't that where Devin is slotted? Well, there's that, the Devin slotted right now on the weak side, the will linebacker. You have two off ball linebackers. Okay, um, yeah. And, and the middle linebacker, the weak side linebacker. Right now, Nicobe is projected to be the starter at middle linebacker. Devin – is projected to be the starter at weak side linebacker. He mentioned Zach Bond first and specifically said um, he believes he can play inside. He said he hasn't done it a lot. He played more outside in New Orleans when he did play, but he thinks he can play inside. Um, and then he went to Devin White, and then he had to stumble around for the other guys, um, which is not good. Uh, but they're not relevant. The Oren Bur Burks of the world aren't relevant anyway. I think Oren's a good backup, but he's fine as your third linebacker. But he's not the guy you want to start. And then you're talking about Nicobe and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. And they're both middle linebackers. So, yeah, we'll see how it shakes out. But it's not a great situation. I no, will say uh, that. that's that's fair to say 100%. I think you know that. Howie knows that. The fans know that. And Vic Fangio knows that <laughs> after he couldn't say a couple of their names. We'll get to a commercial break coming up in 15 minutes or so. Mark Farzetta is going to join John and I. We'll get his reaction, his takeaways from the coordinator press conferences. And then coming up next, John and I will kick back around some Kellen Moore offense and what they're going to do there and how they're going to improve an eighth-ranked offense. I know Damo said it was terrible down the stretch, which it was, but still overall not a bad offense uh, by any metric. So we'll talk about how they'll improve that. All next on Birds 365, make sure you like the show. We'll see you on the other side of the break. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify. 